Good morning, church. Awesome. Come on up here, Pakis and Nelson and the bean in the oven. I wanted to make sure we represent all three of them today. All right. We have a few family items we want to do this morning before we get into the preaching of God's word. And uh, this is Pastor Appreciation Month, right? And so... We've been able to say thank you to our elders who are wonderful. You have been so kind uh, to me as well. And um, we've heard of a, a need with Nelson and Pakis and the little one. And they need a vehicle. Uh, they need to move from the vehicle that they're in to a different vehicle. Uh, the, the baby's on its way. And so once we heard about that, we began praying and wanting to collaborate. And so we want to kind of be a part of that and help them. And it's not just because it's Pastor Appreciation Month, but we really, really appreciate you, Nelson, very much. And Bakis, you've been such a blessing. There's so many women that I speak with at Redeemer in Espanol that you connect with and enjoy. And we really are thankful for both of you um, in many, many ways. Jerry laughed because he knows I'm going to cry. Um, I'm going to tell a little story. So Nelson comes to visit Redeemer oh, I, three years ago or something like that. And we go to sit in the lobby and uh, we just I cannot begin to tell you. We, we started talking and we could have sat there probably for five hours. Easy. We could have just sat there and talked ministry, philosophy, life. And I remember going like, walking away from that meeting going, man, that guy is like my soul brother. Like, that's what I felt like. I was like, man, we, we just hit on the same things. We, we cherish the same things. And I remember going like, wow, I can't believe that he showed up at our church. Little did I know that you would become our Spanish pastor, little did I know that God was orchestrating the launching of Redeemer in Espanol, which has been going on for two years. We're really excited about that. And so we're just thankful for you guys. And um, they've prayed for a long time to have a baby. And uh, we never had that problem. Um, <laughs> I think uh, Preston came um, something like 10 months after our wedding anniversary. And so um, we don't, we've never experienced that. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I sorrow for those even in our church who struggle to have babies. And so, ready, let's go from rejoicing to happy. We're pumped for you. We're excited for you. We really, really are. We're so excited that God has kept you healthy. It's not been the easiest of pregnancies, right, Bakis? <laughs> and, but here is a gift we hope that will help you with your car, all right? And we hope that... You will get that vehicle real soon, all right? Thank you, guys. We love you guys, all right? Thank you. All right, another family item is that we have some um, Keystone members, founding members pieces of our church with us and we're so happy to have Mark and Emily and baby Isaiah with us they're visiting from Michigan and uh, they were such um, a key part of our entire church and of course when God moved them to Michigan we cried a lot um, but I'm, I'm okay with that I want it to hurt I do and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give a shout out to everybody else in the church. If I don't cry when you leave, that's a problem, just so you know, right? <laughs> I, want it to, I want it to hurt, okay? 
This life is a vapor. This life is, um, is not about our comfort and what God's doing. It's about his kingdom. And if he pulls us away for a, a reason, it's for his kingdom purposes, right? And so if we weep when we part from one another, that is a really good thing, right? That means that we've invested in one another. And so we're really happy to have Mark, Emily, and baby Isaiah with us today. I want to go ahead and jump into our text today. Open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. And uh, see, awesome. But before we read our text today, I want to say to you that I love you. Um, I think everybody experiences this in our church who gets to preach, and lately we've had the elders preaching a lot more. We're still looking for an associate pastor to relieve me from administrative things so that I can teach and preach and counsel more. But right now, there's been a lot of administrative work. And one of the things that happens as I prepare God's word for you is I'm reminded on how much I love you. That might be easier for some of you that have been in this faith family for a while and you go, yep, Chago's being sincere when he says that. But I say that to you who are visitors here, um, maybe you're winter visitors or you are uh, been only short time attenders, I can tell you that I love you as well. I enjoy um, seeing you a part of what God is doing here and I'm always humbled by that and it is a privilege. I can't think of ministry in any other way. I can't think of it in any other way than it's that a privilege and a joy. It's a joy completer to see God doing things in your life. And we get to partner together in the gospel in this local body. That's what the church is about. It is a partnership of people in a local body who get to do the work of ministry together. And I love to partner with you in the gospel. I love it. And I love to share in a small way. And I know it's very small. But I love that I share in a, a part of the process of seeing Christ formed in you. Um, that's the goal. The goal of why we preach his word, of why we do ministry, of why we have community groups ultimately is not that we have great fellowship or great uh, teamwork. Those are wonderful things. The ultimate thing is seeing Christ formed in you. Um, that's truly all that matters. And so uh, I just want to say thank you. Here we are appreciating our pastors, right, this month of October, but I am so thankful for you. Again, another family moment. Man, Chago, you got to be careful. I got off the phone with <clears throat> a man named John Anderson. John Anderson, just so you know the impact of our ministry, John Anderson attended our church maybe four months, maybe four, if I remember and he mainly spoke Spanish, could barely speak English, and he sat in here, and I remember going like, man, does he understand half the things I'm saying? John has gone to plant a church in Tallahassee, Florida, and uh, we have a monthly collaboration where we, we talk about church. He just needs a lot of help. He doesn't have elders yet, and so he needs just some support. And when I, I talked to him the other day, he goes, I, I just want you to know that I finally understood what the Bible was all about when I was at Redeemer. And I'm like, well, that, that's a little bit over the top, John. He goes, no, 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 no. I was a raving legalist. I thought the Bible was all about rules and regulations and principles. And it was at Redeemer that I learned that the Bible was all about a person. And it changed my marriage. It changed everything about how I function. And he is now planning a church in Tallahassee. And he is just so enthusiastic. He goes, I'm sharing them with him the gospel. And these people are just eating it up. And we're growing. And just let Redeemer know that that's how I was impacted 
for just four months. And so it's amazing to see what God is doing, right? We, little do we know when God launches people from here and what he's doing, it's for the furtherance of his glory and his kingdom. And so what, what an awesome thing. Let's get into it. Sowing and reaping is our topic today in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. Let's read that together. And then we'll jump into what the text has for us today. Galatians chapter 6. We're almost to the end of this awesome book. Beginning in verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let's pray. God, we need your help. We need your grace. Lord, we come to you, I pray God, in a beggarly posture. God, we are desperate for your truth and for your spirit to do its work. God, we need it. We will not be able to make it in life apart from you. And so God, we come with open hands and open hearts and open minds and may you do that individual, special work in the lives of people today. You're going to speak to them right where they are at. And this is what's so amazing. And so, God, here I have an outline. Here I have a journey. And yet God might reveal an issue about sin or about the flesh. Or God might reveal to somebody a lack of gratitude or a lack of giving. Or, God, that they need to reconcile with somebody. It's wonderful to see how the Holy Spirit particularly deals in the hearts of people. And so we do that again today. We know, Lord, that we will see that come to fruition. And so, God, we yield now to you. Spirit, do your work. Exalt Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Sowing and reaping. Self-deception. Self-deception. It's actually quite an interesting thing. I read quite a bit about self-deception in the last a few weeks leading up to this sermon and I found out that it's one of the most dangerous things that can ever happen to a person to be self-deceived to have a sense of thinking they are right when they are totally wrong is a scary place to be Richard Feynman said the first principle is that you must not fool yourself but you are the easiest person to fool so true Adam Smith, a kind of father of capitalism. Self-delusion is the source of half of the disorders of human life. And I think that we um, are prone to self-deception in a greater way than we ever can realize. And I think we should have very little confidence in ourselves to think that we have it all figured out. Actually, one of the things that my wife said recently that is, just so you know, Trinette, like it's post-worthy, it's Twitter-worthy, okay, it was pretty awesome is she said one time we were talking about a person that, you know, we just, man, sometimes we feel like we're trying to talk to them and we're not getting through. She said, you know, that person just has it way too figured out. Be careful with those people. They have it all figured out. They, have it, they know exactly how everything's supposed to run. They might be probably self-deceived. I read this thing, it's a common occurrence in psychology called the fooling our inner eyes. This concept that people have a perception of themselves that's not real. We think we are better looking than we really are. We're more fit, right, than is actually the case. And it says that most people live with this eye that fools them all the time, this inner eye. And it tends to happen that you lead yourself towards that deception because people compare themselves among themselves. That's what most people do. I'm not as bad as that guy or at least I'm not, you know, this. And it's all part of this self-deception that we can have. And today it starts with the admonition in verse 7 of be not deceived, right? 
Be not deceived. And I want you to know that as we go through this sermon today, that that is something you will have to fight a little bit of, am I living in deception? There's two questions I want to begin with that are overarching questions that will be visited again as we end the sermon today. And that is, what have you been sowing? What have you been investing in? What are you planting right now at this moment? What have you been sowing? And are you happy with what you've been reaping? Are you happy with what is coming to bear in your life? Maybe things that you not, are, have not intentionally planned. There are certain ways that you are responding in life and are you okay with that? These two overarching questions will help us to reflect and to be able to kind of apply just to our life what the text has for us today. And so I have seven principles that we're going to take a look at. You're like, come on, Chago, I'll be fast. Seven principles today that come from this passage that we are prone to self-deception. Humans live by non-negotiable laws. You reap only what you sow. You reap more than you sow. You're always sowing and reaping. Reaping a godly harvest requires patience and persistence. And we seize the opportunities to sow into our faith family. We're prone to self-deception. It begins there in verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It's a declaration of this principle. And God will not be dismissed as a fool is basically what it says. When it says that God is not mocked, it's to turn your nose up at him. It's to be like, whatever, to... Um, to interact with him in a scornful manner. And see, we've been studying the book of Galatians, and so I think Paul very much has on his mind the particular deception that these Galatian believers have been experiencing. What deception have they been uh, sowing into their life? And he says that they've been living by self-effort, that somehow I can make myself right that I can produce something in my life in my own strength and he says what having begun by faith are you not going to complete it by the flesh or trying to make their own righteousness or acceptance and so you see that these Galatian believers have been planting these seeds They've been forsaking the gospel, forsaking what has already been done for them and beginning to live. And I think the warning here, forget the big principle, just the immediate context is that Paul says, wait a second, don't be deceived. If you're going to plant into the flesh, there is a harvest coming for you. And you can't get away from it. God will not be mocked. Just so you know, it's a general warning all over scripture, this concept of deception, of being self-deceived. It's all over the place. I decided not to go and just grab them, but it even says that as the times are coming that people will be deceived and deceiving one another. It's something that we all experience in our life. And I, I said, I just want one example in the Bible where we're really prone to self-deception. And so I pick James chapter 1, verse 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Just that alone should prove to you and me how self-deception works in our lives. You go to Bible study. You go to church. You hear something. You hear a new truth. And you and I are so prone to self-deception that we hear it and say, I don't need to do it. And we repeat that action over and over and over and over and over, right? And every time you repeat that action of God has spoken to me, I ignore it, I will not obey it, it's just another declaration of your deception and my deception. And the scripture is very clear that we are prone to self-deception more than I think we realize. Don't be deceived into thinking that you can violate God's law. So I think what is being declared here in verse 7. The fact of the matter is, is that we often think that somehow the consequences are for somebody else. Somebody else can lie. Somebody else um, can 
cheat and they're going to get punished. But when I do it, I'm the exception. It's not going to hurt me. And that is where we are so self-deceived. Wear a mask long enough and it becomes your face. Play a role long enough and it becomes who you are. We are prone to self-deception. It's the first thing I think that we need to address here. Because if you go there, then I think you'll be humble to go, God, let me listen to your word today. I'm prone to justify myself. I'm prone to think it's not me, it's somebody else. Lord, I don't want to be deceived. That's the starting point. We're prone to it. Let's fight it by going right to God and saying, hey, I acknowledge that I'm prone to that. And I don't want to live in that place. The second principle is humans live by non-negotiable laws. We just do. We wouldn't function without them. So I think of just the scientific laws that we all enjoy, right? Many of you don't even know what they are. I, I don't. But there's laws governing everything that's happening in our world and we like it. We love the repeatability of it. We love that we can bank on it. We, we enjoy that there are these laws for how nature works, right? The sun comes up. The, I've enjoyed that. There's seasons, right? And we've enjoyed some cool weather recently. I love that that law is in existence and that we have to have it for nature to, to flourish and survive. And we have these scientific laws that we all tend to have no issues with at all. We embrace them. This is good. I love the stability. And because I'm terrible at jokes, I literally had to prompt you to say funny story. All right. And so I think of, I read this little funny story where somebody was like, you know, we don't have problems with God's natural law. And if it's like somebody who said, I'm a gravity denier. And he jumps off a, a 50 story building and on the third story, he sees somebody in the window and he yells out, hey, nothing's happened yet. But the law soon, right, will come to bear in his life. Funny story. I hope you all know. Okay. Because, I, man, I've had some few jokes that only my wife is laughing at and I'm really embarrassed. All right. Okay. And so there's scientific laws. Just This is the way God designed nature. And what human beings really struggle with is the moral spiritual laws. And they're there, they're embedded, they're ingrained, they are part of the fabric of who we are. And we often don't realize that it doesn't even matter if you're a Christian or, a not, or not a Christian, if you believe the Bible or don't believe the Bible. Maybe there's a few of you that are just seekers that have been coming to Redeemer for a little bit and you're just like, what is this God thing? And am I going to be, you know, open to this? Or The fact of the matter is, is that we have been designed by a creator, and you are the creature. And you and I have to function within certain moral DNA. That it doesn't matter what you think or what you believe will either lead to your flourishing or lead to your destruction. Lying is bad for you. Did you know that? Christian or not, lying is not good for you. You lie and it's, it's verifiable proof that things will go very poorly for you. You will not be trusted. You will not have friends. You will suffer many, many hardships. Not forgiving is bad for you. Did you know that? Even secular psychologists will say, oh man, we just got to let this go. And they don't, they don't connect it to a biblical principle. They just say, look at people rot away that grow embittered and do not forgive other people. Why? Because God baked it into our DNA. There are moral spiritual laws that you and I have to submit to. Laziness will entrap you. I mean, I've been, I studied laziness with my students at the school and we were going through it and we were just shocked on how much the Bible teaches about people who are lazy and it, it will entrap them. They'll be 29 years old, can't get a job, can't get to work on time and they are enslaved and they don't even know why and laziness Seeds were planted at age 12, 13, 14, 15, and it's bearing this harvest at age 29, and it's destroying their lives. These are moral, uh, spiritual laws that are just baked in, that God has basically designed for humanity to flourish, and we live by these non-negotiable laws. 60 times, 66 times in the Bible, this law of sowing and reaping is taught. 
66 times it says, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. It's all over the Bible. I think of one of the first instances is in Numbers 23, uh, 32, 23. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. There is a day of accountability. There is a day of reckoning. You invest and sow sin. Guess what? Consequences are on the way. And so my heart is really burdened. I deal with a lot, a lot of young people. I really like that niche. The battle often is lost before it started. And I found this from Hendrickson. What strikes me more and more each day is the permanence of one's early life. The identity between youth and manhood. Every habit, good and bad of those early years seems to have permanently affected my whole life. The battle is largely won or lost before it seems or before it seems to begin. And it's not that God can't give us victory later. But moms and dads, when you see a weakness in your child, when you see something there that, oh, this is going to turn out really, really bad, fight it with vigilance. Highlight it. Point it out. Say, we've got to get victory in this area. Whether it's laziness or defying authority or doing their own thing without disregard to, uh, with, with disregard to other people. Because if this principle is true, that whatever we sow, we're going to reap, even if you, honestly, even if you are a Christian, even if you are saved, there's stuff that's going to come into your life. And I read this little quote. This really helped me out. Maybe what's happening to you right now, what you are reaping in your life right now is not even punishment. It's just harvest. What you're reaping is not punishment. It's just it's harvest, right? I, 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 why can I not get along in work? Well, for 10 years, you live for yourself there. I'm glad you're saved and you've had two good years of loving on people, but there's a harvest that you have to live with and it's going to take a while for a new harvest of righteousness to show up. This is just the way it is. And so sometimes it's not even about punishment because of what we've done it's just having to deal with our harvest and so if you break God's law they will break you flat out humans live by non-negotiable laws and this is one of them we break God's laws they will break us they just will we're not designed to lie and to cheat and to be selfish and to be self-centered and to feed our own lust we're not designed for that and we will pay a price our third principle in this passage is found in verse 8 you reap only what you sow I'm going to read verse 8 you reap only what you sow for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption but the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life simple here you get what you plant you get what you plant too many Christians sow to the flesh every day and wonder why they don't ever reap holiness. It is kind of a foolish thing, isn't it? It goes back to this kind of self-deception thing. God's not going to be mocked. He sets the, the whole system up this way. It is the most foolish thing for me to go, God, I want to reap a life of holiness. But I'm not going to sow one thing today to get there. And many people live like that. Many people walk through life like that. Why am I not more mature? Why am I not more stable? It's super easy. What have you been sowing? Why am I not these things? What have you been sowing? Because one day you will become those things if you sow those things. And so you only will get what you sow. Nothing else. And this has been very helpful. We long to be godly, but believe that one day it will just happen. And when somebody just kind of says, okay, God, I'm going to sit back and you, you just make it happen. What, are, what steps are you taking? Are you pursuing prayer? Are you trying to meditate on God and his word and truth? Do you have community in your life? Do you even go to church? I don't, but I want to be a great dad one day. What are you thinking? What, what are you thinking? Like, that's not going to happen. You've got to sow the right things to produce the right things. And so we only reap what we sow. And here there's two descriptors, the flesh and the spirit. We've been talking about that. Let's go read it real quick. Go to chapter 5. I want to read the list 
of the works of the flesh beginning in verse 19. So when you think about investing into the flesh, what does that mean? Verse 19 of chapter 5, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So it's not like, you know, the master list. It's just an ex example uh, list. Then let's move on to verse, 20 thing, uh, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so here's a descriptor for us, right? Am I going to sow into the flesh or am I going to sow into the Spirit? What does it mean to sow into the flesh, Chago? Well, I, I like this word, so I hope you'll go with me, all right? What do you pander to? What do you pander to? What, what do you kind of give into, right? What, what, what do you kind of give a platform for in your life? What do you give space in your heart for? And when I think of sowing into the flesh, I think of this, what do you pander to? We sow to the flesh when we pander to it. When we indulge our fantasies, when we give into anger and bitterness, when we lose our temper, when we give into gluttony, when we sh shirk our duties, when we lie about our actions, when we dabble in pornography and then excuse it as meaningless, when we lower our standards and compromise our convictions. What do you pander to? And I really want to make this very simple today. When I say, are we going to sow into the flesh? Or are we going to sow into the spirit? I want to make it very, very simple. But often what we pander to or what we're willing to, to have an appetite for is to be angry, is to think those ugly thoughts about somebody, is to feel slighted and sit there and stew on that a little bit. No one appreciates me. No one thanks me ever. Like, we, what do you pander to? If you pander to the things of the flesh, my problem is this, ready? Chapter 5 has a list of like all these ugly descriptions of the flesh. And then I read this to you and you go, yeah, I sometimes act a little bitter. Sometimes I act a little bit uh, like a glutton or I lose my temper. They feel like respectable sins, right? Like Jerry Bridges. These kind of like, this is not a big deal. But the harvest, I think, that you should really be focused on of what these will eventually look like is that list in chapter 5. Like, one day you can't control your sexual appetites. One day you, you can't help but have war and fighting and give everybody a piece of your mind. Like, that's where it will end up. That's where the harvest will be. So what do you pander to? We're only going to pander in two places, right? The flesh or the spirit. So Chaga, what does it mean to sow to the spirit? What does it mean to sow to the spirit? Man, I, didn't, I wanted to keep this as super simple as I could. And I hope I've done that. And here, instead of pander, I have the word yield. What do you yield to? Whatever you yield your members to, that is what you obey. What do you yield to? Sowing to the spirit just means to be preoccupied and dominated by the spirit. And I know I'm going to give you a description right now that's going to be overly simplistic, but I hope that you'll do it. Instead of pandering to the flesh, you just yield to the Holy Spirit. You say, okay, Chago, I want to begin sowing seeds into the Spirit. Because I want to reap peace and joy, love, patience, gentleness, kindness. That's what I want to have in my life someday. So what do you mean by yielding to the Spirit? It's to be dominated preoccupied, controlled, conscious, walking in the Holy Spirit. It's this kind of mindset that you're always kind of saying to yourself, like, what would God want me to do right now? How should I respond? You're going to have a time at a tabletop, and we're going to be talking about the sermon, and you might walk away, and I would say, are you going to yield to the Holy Spirit? What is he revealing to you that you need to deal with, that you need to respond to? And I'm going to tell you right now, the secret, or even like, to me, the definition of success is what I'm about to put on the screen right here. Because people that I see ultimately live in victory, they do what I'm about to put on here. And they do it regularly. They do it multiple times a day. They're awake. They're talking to God. Their feet being prodded by God. Their conscience is awake to God. Because it's all about obedience. 
It's all about obedience. Like that simple. It is, it is me having a decision of, oh man, I have this bad thought. I'm thinking unlovely things about somebody. Man, I shouldn't do that. God, forgive me. Lord, let me and, and replace that with being thankful for them. You go, man, that sounds overly simplistic. But it's not that you just do it one time. It's that it becomes a state of practice for you. You do it over and over and over again. You get angry, you lose your temper. Instead of in the past, you hiding it and saying, there is no way on God's earth I will ever like, tell my kids I was wrong. You say, fooey with that. Kids, get into the living room. I lost my cool and it was so wrong. Please forgive me. That's yielding to the Spirit. And you do that over 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 and you will be shocked that when you just obey what God is prompting you to do on a regular basis, you will be walking in the Spirit. That's just as simple as I can put it. I don't want to overcomplicate it because you reap only what you sow and as you begin to invest in these things as you begin to say I'm going to yield I'm going to take a step of obedience you know we don't have a lot of altar calls here but I've been thinking about going through a season of of a time for decision maybe our elders can come forward and we can pray with them because sometimes you're leaving here without taking a step of obedience and that's harming you it is it's harming you to feel great conviction about this or that and for you not to go, man, Lord, I need to just confess that right now. And we need to regularly yield to the Holy Spirit. And as simple to me as it can be is that it's all about obedience. Just obeying to what God is saying and doing your life. You reap more than you sow is our next principle. And here you see that the fruit of the flesh, it says, is what? It's corruption or it's death. So the fruit of the spirit, I mean, the fruit of the flesh is corruption or death. And when I say that you reap more than you sow, it's because it's the law of multiplication. Like this is just the way it is in nature. You know, one of my favorite lessons to te teach my kids is to sit down with a laptop nowadays and show them compound interest, right? Right? Hey, if you would put 500 bucks away as a 12-year-old, you know, this is what it looks like, you know. Why? Because it's a law of multiplication. It's just the way it works. But I'm going to tell you right now that when I think of this, I think of how harsh this can be. What? You mean my practice of lying, my practice of selfishness, my practice of loving things, my practice of loving money has that kind of consequence God are you kidding and sadly the fruit that comes out of some of the seeds that we have sown in the flesh we felt were so minuscule but because of the law of multiplication you always reap more than you sow like honestly let's go back to that lazy item you were lazy, you were lazy, you were lazy, you had this streak in you, your grandpa, your mama, everybody said, get it out of him, and it didn't happen, right? He's a little lazy, but he'll make do, he'll kind of make it in life somewhere down the road, and like I said, he's 25 years old, 27 years old, can't get a job, can't get up in the morning. You're like, that's a pretty harsh consequence for someone who didn't clean their room in age 12. It... I don't know about you, but I just have a lot of sympathy here because it seems pretty harsh. But that's just the law. That's just the way God has designed things to be. Right? This can be very, very harsh. And I want to read these. Some of you know these, even by memory. I remember when I was 12 years old in a little camp somewhere, and the pastor brought these up, and I've never forgotten, uh, forgotten it. Sin will cost you more than you ever intended to pay. Sin will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. And sin will take you further than you ever intended to stray. And there are many of you in here, because, you know, we're not super vocal in this church. But there are many in you here who would go, amen. I did it. I lived it. I know the harshness of that reality. Right? Because you reap way more than you sow. And it can be very, very harsh. But the fruit of the Spirit is an eternal life. 
And I just added this concept of abundant life because I don't think it's just speaking of my eternity with God after I, I'm uh, done here on earth. No, this concept always in the scriptures is about the quality of life. It's about eternal life right now. And so just as harsh as it can seem, I like to bring balance to the force, all right? As harsh as it can seem that I could sow some selfish things here and reap this really tough harvest over here, let's just all kind of be like honest. I'm always astounded at our pathetic investment in God. I, I want to please you, God. I could be passionate for a day or two, then I drift. Come back to you and, oh God, I really do need to deal with that sin. I know I, it just seems to be always there. Okay, I'll take a stab at it. And you, you put, eh, poquito nada, very little effort into it. I'm not speaking in tongues, you winter Texans. That was Spanish. And so, and you, you, you put a little bit into it and I'm always overwhelmed and you should be too. And when we have our Thanksgiving celebration here in November, and the English or Spanish church are here, and we have a time to say, what are you guys thankful for? Here's some, a mic. We should be overwhelmed with the goodness of God. Amen. Your investment and my investment in my spiritual well-being is absolutely pathetic. And you know it, and I know it. This is why I, I always am like, you know how good God is? Some of you have walked in here with zero intention of really hearing from God. You walked in here with zero intention in elevating God to his rightful place in your heart. You walked in saying, man, I had a rough morning. I worked super late last night. I'm barely here. My baby was up for two hours. I'm not even faulting you. I'm not accusing you. I'm just saying your aspirations when you walk through that door back there is, Lord, help me get by. Help me not to fall asleep. And God in his kindness for your itty-bitty investment in his kingdom is going to reap a bountiful reward in your life. And you did very little for that. So as harsh as it can be, that I have to reap some ugly things in my life for my sin. Oh my word, look at the harvest we get when we do very little for God. It's an amazing, amazing concept. So this can be very encouraging as well, right? It's, it's both. It's a little discouraging that something can entrap you so bad. But isn't it so encouraging that just a small little investment that God can do so much with it. Fifth principle, you're always sowing and reaping. Whew, this is a tough one because you are sowing and reaping right now. I've, I've been very guilty of this concept. Okay, God, I'm about to sow because I really feel like I need to do this. What I really need to sometimes be awake to is like, what am I experiencing in my life right now because of what I have sown already? Does that make sense? You're sowing and reaping all the time it's a continuum what are you sowing I lost my laptop have no fear I think I know what to do you're always sowing and reaping all the time what are you sowing right now look at your mental thoughts track them look at your money look at your schedule that'll tell you what you're sowing is there ever any time for people and for God and for church? Nope. It's all about my work. It's all about, you're sowing right now. Don't expect three years from now this harvest of righteousness if you're never giving anything to God. You're always sowing and reaping. It's this continuum. Right now you're doing it. And I don't know why God has really burdened me in the last three months for our families. I don't know why. I told you it all started with the dinner with the Mireles in the summer but I have just been so burdened for our families because you are sowing into your families right now righteousness or flesh you're doing it right now we get so sad to hear of our young people who might leave the church and never come back to him time out 
They're responsible for themselves. They make their own choice. We all understand that. But I hope that the stuff I'm sowing into my family now is going to have a harvest of righteousness in them later. That they long for church. That they long for community. How, how can you expect any of your children to love the church if you give it your very last in your family? Church will be literally the last thing we do after club soccer, after dance. and after, like We'll give God the very least at the very end. And you expect a harvest to come out of your children's life? It's just not going to happen, folks. And so my warning to our families is that, man, sow to the Spirit in your families. Sow to the Spirit in your families. Sow to them. What did you sow? What are you sowing? So important. You're always doing it. Six, reaping a godly harvest requires patience and persistence. This is why he goes to the next verse, if you'll read that with me. In verse 9, and let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. You know, when you start to sow to the Spirit, just so you know, I think it's hard work. I think it's hard work. I don't think it's something easy and convenient. It takes effort. It takes like, oh man, God help me. I need to be inspired. Like, it takes a lot to do this over. And that's why he says, don't grow weary in it. Why do we lose heart? I think we lose heart because we don't see quick results. Because of the nature of this law of sowing and reaping, a lot of times the fruit doesn't come overnight. And so I can get desanimado. Man, God, I discipled that dude for six months. Where's the harvest? Don't grow weary. Because the results are not quick. We get duped by Satan. That what we do is insufficient, insignificant. That it's not enough. That it's a waste of time. And Satan will deceive us into those things. That this is not... Community group, come on. A bunch of people just hanging out together. Like, not for me. Give me deep theology. And I'll go, you can have your deep theology all day. I will always ask you, who do you pray with? Who do you confess your faults with? Whose burdens do you bear? Who do you care for? Whose soul is on your heart? nobody I just love me and my theology and I'm like I promise you you are not healthy I promise you you're not healthy all right because it can be something that we get duped into all right and often the good becomes mundane Calvin not Juan Curling that's okay I'll give a quote one day for you Juan up here JC but Calvin said we are naturally lazy in the duties of love we're naturally lazy in the duties of love. And it's so sad. And this is why we have admonitions in the scripture like 2 Thessalonians 3.13. Brethren, be not weary in well-doing. 1 Corinthians 15.58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor, your sowing is not in vain in the Lord. Keep it up. Keep it up. This is a general admonition. We... We get tired of doing good. I said this to my staff recently in a little diva. I'm like, isn't it sad that we get tired of doing good? We get tired of investing in people, praying with people, checking in on people, pursuing people. Like, we get tired of that. That just shows you our fallen nature that that becomes boring to us. And so, it requires patience and persistence. Do not grow weary in well-doing. And seven, the last admonition in verse 10. So then as we have opportunity, that's the, really the really important piece here. Let us do good to everyone, of course. And especially to those who are the household of faith. Look for the opportunities. We're actually given an admonition here at the very last verse that says, it's not that opportunities show up. It's that you go make those opportunities. That's exactly what it means in the Greek. It's not saying do good when others come and give you an opportunity. No, it says do good by looking for opportunities. That's exactly what the Greek is saying. That you become someone who is looking, pursuing ways to do good to others. And you're motivated by the gospel. You're motivated because so much good has been done for you. And you look for opportunities. And so about this household of faith piece real quick. 
why? 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 I just think, and I move away from the pulpit just so you know when I'm talking Chagoisms. All right? I think it's because of just where you're going to get your most bang for your buck. Right? If, if I went and loved all my neighbors around me and hardly any of them know Jesus and I do good to them, there, there is some merit there. God calls us to do that kind of thing. But if I make sure that I'm doing good to those of the household of faith and I come alongside and encourage them and I come alongside and bear up their arms and I come alongside and spur them on and they spur me on, they're going to have influence on neighbors I never will have. They will have more effectiveness in ministry that I could never, ever have. Does that make sense? And this is why I think we're called specifically to do good to those of the household of faith. Because if we're healthy in here, we're going to have a great impact out there. And so this is why we're called to look for opportunities to do good. Our motivation is we do good, do good to others because good was done to us and we were not doing good. God pursued us. God helped us. The gospel gives me the power to be good at the exhausting ones, to the deaf ones, to the sad ones. You say, man, it's so hard to help people that just don't listen, that don't respond. You didn't either. And you may not very soon. And so the gospel empowers me because of the great good that has been done to me. Because I was that way and I will be that way again. So these are the seven principles that I see in this passage. And so I want to end with those two questions again. What have you been sowing? What have you been sowing? You might want to just have a time of self-reflection and go, okay, God, what, is, what harvest am I experiencing right now? Well, what did you sow in the past? And I think it's so important that if you have an aspiration, and I know many of you do, to love God and to grow and to be mature and to use your life for something. It's only a vapor. That's all you guys got. A vapor of a life. I hope you don't waste one minute. I know I've wasted way too many. What are we sowing? And are you happy with what you've been reaping? Are you experiencing that spiritual fruit, that abundant life? Man, I've got these friends. I've got this community. I've got... I've got my kids walking in truth. I, right? Are you happy with what you've been reaping? And my last admonition, I saw this from an old dead dude. He said, so Christ. What do I do, Chago? You told me to obey. Yes, I think that's what you do. Prompt to obey. But I thought about this in a more particular way. I, I said, you know, how about if I sowed Christ? How about if I was like, I want them to see Jesus in this situation. Man, that offense hurt me a lot, but I'm going to sow Christ. Christ did not get revenge. I won't either. See, I just want you to make this connection because I want you to start sowing Christ in all kinds of ways. I'm sowing it here and in there. I'm sowing it in that particular thing. I'm sowing, sowing it to my wife. I'm, why am I going to serve my wife, you know? Happy wife, happy life. No, I'm going to sow Christ into my wife. I'm going to serve her. Because I want a lot of Jesus in my home. And if we sow a lot of Christ in this place and in your lives and in your relationship, here's the great news. We're going to reap a lot of Christ. We're going to enjoy that in such an amazing way. We get lots of Jesus if we sow a lot of Jesus. And so I encourage you to do that. We're always sowing and reaping. Don't be disheartened if you're really experiencing a really, really ugly harvest right now. Are you sowing good stuff right now? Because if you do, I promise you that law of multiplication is coming and abundance of peace and joy and goodness is headed your way. Because that's the law. Let's not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Let us sow Christ together. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, God, for these people. Lord, there are so many of them that I see continually pouring themselves out. They inspire me. I didn't even get to say that about Nelson. He's such an inspiration to me. 
the way he loves people and the way he spends hours with people praying and counseling with them. The way I see people serve on a Sunday morning on setup team. I choose to use my life to serve God and serve others. Their life infuses me with energy and hope. And so God, would you just keep us humble? Lord, help us to confess that we are prone to self-deception. I know I am. And so, God, I want to sow into the Spirit. I want to sow Christ in this place so that we can have the fruit, Lord, of that Spirit in this place of love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness. And so I thank you, God, for a church that's doing that. I pray, God, for people today who feel under the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their particular situation to either confess a sin, maybe they've been harboring some type of attitude, Maybe, God, they've been very um, uh, full of complaining. And, God, you got to deal with their heart. They're sowing to the flesh. May they forsake that and sow into the Spirit. Do, God, your special work in their life. We thank you for the offering as well. That, again, is that law of multiplication. People just give in this place. They give abundantly and over the top. And so, Lord, I thank you for that. May people just obey you. And realize that everything in their life is a gift from you. They get to keep a very large portion of it. And they get to gladly give back to you. So use it for your kingdom, God. And for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.